From the newsrooms of the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Please Explain. I'm Samantha Selinger Morris. It's Thursday, November 9th. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced this week that Israel will retain security responsibility for Gaza once the fighting ends. But when will that be? The war with Hamas is now in its second month. Thousands of Gazans have died, many buried beneath rubble as a result of Israeli airstrikes. The living struggle to find food, shelter, and water. For some Palestinian Australians, like Sama Sabawi, a poet and writer living in Melbourne, it's a nightmare. Sabawi has 75 family members in Gaza, where she was born. Today, she joins me to discuss what her family is experiencing in the battle-strewn territory, and what Palestinians in Gaza think of Hamas. Sama, welcome to Please Explain. The images of Gaza that many of us are now seeing from the safety of our homes here in Australia are scenes of horror and devastation. You were born in Gaza and you went back to see many of the family members that you have there just two months ago. So can you tell us a bit about what Gaza is like when the bombs are not falling on the area? So Gaza, when when we went to visit, uh, was um, a very beautiful Mediterranean city. People would be swimming in the water um, well into one, two o'clock in the morning. There was a lot of life and it was almost exaggerated in in a sense. People completely threw themselves into their moments of joy. And when you think about a place that's under siege constantly, it's been under siege since 2007, under occupation since 1967. It's a city that understands, the people there understand how precious life is, how quickly it goes, how quickly you lose you lose what you've got. And so in the moments in between, there is a vengeance for life, for celebration, for, for doing all the visits, you know, all the, the weddings, all the ceremonies. It was beautiful. I mean, it was so beautiful. I wanted to spend more time. We were planning to go back. Lots of musicians, lots of art, because this kind of life produces a lot of art and, and creativity. And beautiful touches. It was easy on the eye, no matter where we went. Even in refugee camps, it was clean, organized. People took pride in their homes, took pride in their hospitality, took pride in in their cooking um, to a standard that I haven't seen elsewhere. So when and why did you leave Gaza and move to Australia? I was uh, born in Gaza in 67, about two months after the Israeli occupation uh, of Gaza. My dad had left. He was part of the Arab armies. He was part of the Egyptian army. They recruited Palestinians to fight in what they called Jish al-Tahrir, the Liberation Army. And so he fought uh, in 1967 to keep Israel uh, off the occupation of Gaza. So after the occupation, uh, the Israeli army was looking for anyone who participated and the choice was imprisonment or exile. Uh, So he went into exile. And then my mom waited a few months and it became clear that that Israel was going to, that this is an enduring occupation. So she followed. Uh, she just crossed the Allenby Bridge with me in her arms. I was uh, a 40 months old baby and three other kids who were all under six. And so tell me, because you do still have 75 family members living in Gaza now, The bombs have been falling in Gaza for about a month now in this latest war. So can you tell us, where is your family in Gaza and what has their life been like in Gaza over this time? Uh, My husband is also from Gaza. So his family is predominantly, uh, they lived in the Rimal neighborhood, which was one of the first that was evacuated and, and bombarded. This is a family that's been in Gaza for generations, not um, not since 1948. And so they have land and they're a very large family. So everyone from his family in Rimal, they went to the south to, to seek shelter there. The one family that remained, um, their second cousins to, to my husband, their home was bombed and n- none of them can be retrieved. Uh, So we don't know who died or who's alive under the rubble, but there's no fuel for equipment. There's been no international help to try to get people to help people with the digging through rubble. And we just hope that they all died instantly and that they're not 
continuing the suffering. And this is not an unusual story right now. My family uh, is scattered all over the South, except one of my, my first cousin and her husband and three children uh, disappeared uh, on their way to the South. Uh, it's been six, seven days. I've put up their photos on Facebook in case anyone knows what happened to them. Uh, but we're hearing from people that there's a lot of corpses on that road from the North to the South that haven't been collected or identified. So it, it's been, like I said, seven days since they went missing. It's, yeah, the hope is very dim right now. And so what is this like for you? You're so far away. I can't even imagine what it must be like sleeping through the night, thinking about your family over there. What is it like for you when you wake up first thing in the morning? What are the sort of things that you think about if, if you are sleeping through the night? So we don't, we don't really sleep through the night. People are um, facing starvation. The most dignified people I've ever met in my life who would give you even the last thing in their cupboards. Um, if you're a guest, they feed you, they look after you. For me, it's about people I know and I love, um, children that we've lost, um, family members we've lost. My, my aunt who died of terror, just terror alone can kill you. She had a heart attack. Um, so the, there was ongoing bombing uh, almost every two minutes. There was a, a bomb going off and her children have explained, her, her son who was looking after her, that she was just jumping with every bomb, jumping with every bomb and just squeezing his hand tighter and tighter. And then her heart just couldn't make it. Um, children are being subjected to this, families. So, no, we don't sleep. I don't know how we keep going, but we do. We'll be right back. Sama, I wanted to ask you about your hope that Palestinians will one day have a homeland alongside Israel. How are you feeling about that now? So, in my hopes, I'm first of all, what, what fuels my hope is to see how many Jewish activists um, and amazing, amazing people from the Jewish community have joined uh, the Palestinian call for an end to apartheid, which in effect means uh, the beginning of, of equality, the end of a regime that gives preferential treatment only to the Jews and treats everybody else like second, third and fourth class, not even citizens. Uh, so that gives me hope because that movement is invigorating. I mean, we saw in Washington, they were in the lead. It was the Jewish activists who were in the lead calling for this. It is possible. I see this piece every time I, I go to a protest and I'm linking arm in arm with my Jewish sisters and brothers who are calling for the same thing. And what we really need is a rethinking uh, and a reimagining of a coexistence and a sharing of the land where everyone has equal rights. But this idea that we need to eliminate them and they need to eliminate us, this, this idea that political humanitarian struggles can be overcome by extreme militancy and through war, uh, that is not going to work, even if they end up occupying all of Gaza and expelling all the Palestinians in Gaza outside. We're just looking at prolonging the time when we can actually sit together and talk about equality and sharing the land. There's no other way. And Sama, you've written that you're tired of writing about the impact of massacres on your Palestinian family and loved ones, but that you are still writing. So what do you think it will take for you to no longer have to write about this, for this to no longer be your family's experience? I think that we are at the tipping point where we're seeing that no longer do what the politicians say about Palestine reflect the people's will around the world. Uh, we're seeing demonstrations in sizes like never before for Palestinian rights and for an end to the occupation and end to the siege. And I think this will be translated into political will, not overnight, but eventually. And then one day, I mean, this can't go on forever, right? One day we don't have to worry about anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and anti-Palestinianism. One day we can all just coexist as equals 
and move on to the next phase. Maybe that's when I will start writing about the things I want to write about. I want to write about love and adventure. I want to write stories that don't have bombs in them. What if I write a play about raising teenagers? You know, <laughs> that would be really nice one day. Absolutely. Sama, thank you so much for your time and sharing your story with us. Thank you so much for having me um, and thank you for listening. Today's episode of Please Explain was produced by Julia Carr Katzel with technical assistance by Debbie Harrington. Our executive producer is Ruby Schwartz. Please Explain is a production of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. If you enjoy the show and want more of our journalism, subscribe to our newspapers today. It's the best way to support what we do. Search The Age or smh.com.au forward slash subscribe. I'm Samantha Salinger-Morris. This is Please Explain. Thanks for listening.